Hey, everybody. Fascinating discussion today on the role of data governance in this new era of AI. Felix, how are you? I'm doing really well. How are you, Evan? I'm really well. Thanks so much for joining. Really intrigued by your mission and vision at Calibra. Maybe start with introductions uh, to yourself and the team at Calibra. Absolutely. Um, so I'm Felix van der Maalen, uh, co-founder, CEO of Calibra. Uh, Calibra, we're a software company focusing on data governance, data intelligence, basically doing more with trusted uh, data. Uh, we help large organizations uh, across any industry understand what data they have, um, how to trust it, how to use it effectively, how to make it easier to find the right data. And as you can imagine, as you hinted at in the world of AI, uh, data is, is more important than ever. Trusted data is more important than ever. There's only more data. There's more people that want to do something with that data. There's more use cases that require that data. There's more scrutiny on that data from a privacy security perspective. Uh, and so they doing data at scale in a trusted way is incredibly important. And, uh, and we've been doing this for 16 years now. Uh, started the company in 2008. Wow. So we've been at it for a while, but the data has, data has only become more and more important. So uh, still super excited to, of the work that we're doing. Yeah, today's your day to shine and thrive. Uh, but talk about the role of data governance from when you started, maybe, through to the current era. And, you know, why is it so crucial for all users to access all data? A absolutely. And, and, and it's only become more important. Uh, we started mm. the company in 2008, actually. A spin off from the University of Brussels. Uh, the four founders were doing academic research on semantic technology, which is now again in, in vogue. But uh, how do you get people together to agree on what data means? And that's kind of was our, our, our background. We were really passionate about that. But data wasn't as big as it is today, uh, 2008. Mm. So we started 2008. As you can imagine, 2008, what makes you think of 2008? Financial crisis. And actually, financial crisis helped us find the initial product market fit because all of those large financial institutions had to suddenly prove to the regulator that they were in control of their data. They understood what mm. data they had, who was being used, how they were calculating uh, their, uh, their their reports and their, their key key metrics. And so data suddenly became a business problem and controlling data, data governance became a, a, a business problem. And that's where we can initially start it, where data governance became a big topic. Uh, there was a new role in the organization, the chief data officer, very much tasked with, hey, help us control, help us comply to all of these new regulations that we are now being faced with because the regulators are asking us, prove to us that, again, you're in control of your data. So that was kind of step one between 2008, 2010, 2012, uh, where that was kind of the, the key the key first phase. The other kind of big change that we've seen then is, is this, this trend towards self-service analytics. At the time, it was mm. Tableau and Click, and now we have Power BI. Like Everybody wanted to use data to do their job. Everybody became an analyst. Uh, data democratization, right? Access to data for everyone, which was fantastic, but we can imagine what happens as it becomes scale, right? Everybody has everything. So there's 50 different versions of the same report with 15 different numbers. And then the question becomes, okay, why is my number right and your number wrong? And that became really problematic. So again, you needed governance and trust um, for analytics, uh, for reporting. Uh, the other big shift that we saw at the time was big data. Suddenly everybody really, well, actually the more data we have, the more we can kind of cre create value from it. But again, as you can imagine, uh, uh, organizations started to capture more and more data. The problem was, wasn't do we have the right data? The problem is how do we find the right data? The, the analogy I like to make is that your haystack, your, your, your data, your data lake has gotten a lot bigger. The needle you want to find, that data set that you need to do some analysis, build a model is still as small. So you actually made it harder to find the right data. And so again, that's where data cataloging became really important or data marketplace. How do we help everybody find the right data so they can actually do the job, job they want to do with that data? So that was another really important uh, kind of shift in this data governance. Um, from a role perspective, the chief data officer became the chief data and analytics officer because it wasn't just playing defense and regulatory. It was also playing offense and, okay, how do we help our organization become more data driven? Um, so that was a big, a big shift. And then over the last five years, of course, the move to the cloud, data modernization, every organization is modernizing their infrastructure, move from on-prem on -prem legacy tooling to the cloud to deal with that kind of uh, that volume, that complexity, that performance, that scale. And again, you can't move things to the cloud if you don't know what you have. Organizations, larger organizations are always very concerned that all the controls that they have on their on-prem environment 
we have them on our cloud environment as well. So again, data governance became incredibly important to help in those data modernization uh, trajectories. And now kind of where we are today, uh, to no surprise to anybody, AI is the big, the big driver. Um, and we've had data privacy uh, in there as well with GDPR, CCPA, again, sensitive data classifications, uh, how, how we're using that data, how we're storing that data. And now in, in the world of AI, I think it's been clear now that uh, data is probably the, the biggest impact on the quality of a, of a model, what data are you using to train your model and, and how is the quality of the data impacting the quality of the results. Um, a lot of organizations are using existing commercial open source models, then they're using their own proprietary enterprise data on top of those models. Again, how do you deal with privacy concerns? How do you deal with security concerns? How do you make sure that the quality you're using of the, that data is correct? How are you monitoring it? How are you assessing risks? How are you uh, validating that this is something that you actually want to do? So all of these problems, again, with AI uh, is only kind of bigger and bigger and bigger, and data governance is only becoming more and more uh, important. Well, wow, that's quite a lot to unpack, you know, fascinating uh, overview. Uh, talk, if you would, about the role of the chief data citizen, something you talk a lot about. I haven't heard that term of art uh, yet, but elaborate on the roles, responsibilities for the chief data citizen and, and how it's different from, you mentioned, chief data officer, chief analytics officer, these kind of more traditional roles. Yeah, and it, it's really, it goes back to kind of our mission and vision where where we believe that everybody in an organization ultimately needs data to do their job. Uh, mm. That's kind of the, everybody has become a knowledge worker. And every, we, we call knowledge work, we call it a data citizen, right? Everybody uh, has become a data citizen. And so as a citizen, you have rights and responsibilities. And we really like that kind of balance. And as a data citizen, you have the right to easily be able to access uh, high quality trusted data. Uh, and we should make it as easy as possible for anybody to do that effectively because it's so important to do their job effectively, right? And that's your right as a data citizen, easy access to trusted data. But as a data citizen, you also have a responsibility. You have a responsibility to treat that data appropriately, right? There are privacy mm. concerns, there are uh, confidentiality concerns, there are security concerns, and it, that balance is, is really important. Um, but a lot of organizations, if you think about it, their biggest challenge with data it's not having a bigger database, right? It's not having a faster database. If, it, if they're not able to get value from data, it's not because they don't have the cloud, right? It's because they still have to build that culture in their organization, that data literacy, that data-driven culture to actually train people of how to use data, where to find data, how, what they can do with, uh, with data. And so to kind of um, uh, accentuate that fact, we believe that this role of a chief data citizen in practice that's typically the chief data, chief analytics officer, but just to double down on this, this importance of building that data culture, building that data literacy, being probably much more impactful in your ability to get value from data than, again, having a, a bigger or faster uh, database. And so that's why we really kind of double down on that role. We have our own chief data citizens, one of our co-founders internally, who runs our data team, make sure that all of our uh, equilibrians, as we call ourselves, are, are very data driven. Um, and that's something that we kind of really advocate and, and encourage our customers to, to do as well. Oh, fantastic. And data science is changing fundamentally, too. Uh, very different role today and in the future than we've seen in the past. Uh, massive growth expected across this field. But how do you see this transition from, you know, a, a data steward role as a data scientist to kind of AI steward? And what, what needs to change within the organization or the culture? Great, great question. And, and so again, over the, over the last few years, we've had the rise of the chief, uh, the, the the data steward, right, to make sure that mm -hmm. we can trust that data, almost as the 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 glue between the business stakeholders, knowledge worker, and the, the technical uh, the technical personas. And you definitely need that kind of that glue uh, to kind of bring those teams uh, together. Uh, and now with AI, I think you're going to see a very similar uh, needs. Uh, you have the very technical machine learning engineers, uh, and you have the business problems, the business use cases of what, what can we actually mm. use AI for that drives business value. How do you bring those two together and do that in a way that is uh, appropriate from a risk perspective, from a cost perspective, from a business value perspective, right? And so I think the data stewards are actually really well positioned because so much about AI is really data. I think there's this saying that AI is really just a user interface on top of your data, which I like, and, and, it, and it's sometimes true. Um, so data steward, you have an enormous opportunity to jump in into that kind of AI steward role, if you will, 
to also facilitate and, and facilitate the collaboration between all these different stakeholders, which is absolutely critical to be able to put uh, or to 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 put an AI use case all the way from kind of prototyping uh, discovery all the way into production. Because what we've found and what we've seen with all of our customers that we work with is that it's it's not an easy process. Prototyping around AI, especially now with generative AI, is easy, right? And that's mm. a big a big unlock where it's so easy to use ChatGPT and Claude and, and all these other models to have a quick prototype. And it's really compelling. But getting that from 80% quality to the 95 or 99% quality that it often re requires to be to actually be in production is, is, is actually a big lift. And, and there's a lot of concerns around, again, security, privacy, risk. All these people, legal, uh, finance, they all need to get involved to, put in, to, to push an AI use case from, again, development into production. And typically, a data scientist or a machine learning engineer is not the best person to do that. One, it's not typically mm. their kind of core strength. And two, you want them working on building great models, great use cases, and training. You don't want them necessarily having to kind of do all the collaboration with all these different stakeholders, mm. right? And so that's where, again, there's an opportunity around AI governance. This is why it's not just around kind of risk control, but also how to ac accelerate the process of putting an AI use case in production and for an AI steward to help facilitate that. Uh, so kind of accelerating the ability to kind of innovate with AI in, uh, in organizations. Fantastic. And you work with almost a thousand companies, customers in this space. Um, talk about a data-driven culture. What's, uh, what are best practices? What have you seen that works or doesn't work both internally and, and externally when they're facing customers, partners, et cetera? Uh, absolutely. Uh, there's, there's a couple of things. Uh, we're working with a very large um, again, uh, Heineken, right? which I'm sure we mm. all, all know and, and appreciate. Very familiar. <laughs> uh, very familiar. Great great company to uh, to work with. Uh, they've been a long-term partner and, and they've really built their, their own kind of language, a shared language, because digital transformation is a key part of their strategy. They need to have a shared common language to be able to kind of drive that digital transformation. Like, what do we mean by the consumer? What do we mean by the customer? What does that really mean for us? How do we address that? You need to drive alignment. And so building that data literacy, that data culture, often start by making sure you actually understand each other and you build that common language in a very large, complex, international, global organization, right? And so that, that's a really important part. Um, it seems simple, but it's, it's, it's really cornerstone. Uh, the second I think, best practice that we see with, with our customers is that thinking, uh, uh, moving backwards. And instead of starting from the data and starting from the technology, start from the business problem or start from the business opportunity. Where do we have an opportunity to use data for? What is the use case? And then work backwards, what data do we need for that use case? And, and that's kind of how you drive your data. That's how you how you decide what to work on. And there's a, a trend recently that, that we're seeing a lot of uh, uh, traction with, uh, which we fully uh, aligned to is this data product thinking. Like how do you how do you take product product management thinking and apply it to data and like product management what is an opportunity uh, you build a business case you do exploration what is the solution and, and you really build a complete product a complete product is not just the software code that you write it's, it's usability it's documentation it's go to market it's pricing it's, it's the whole package right and you should think of data in the same way it's not, uh, data the value of data is not just a table in a database that, that's not the value. The value is, if I want to do customer churn analysis, where do I find a customer churn data product that I can use? Yes, there's a data component to it, but it's also, is there documentation? What are the SLAs? What are the privacy concerns? How am I able to use that? Are there examples that I can easily use? Is there documentation that I can use? If I have a problem, where do I go to? What is the data quality? So all these concerns, like actually building a data product it's really, it's really important because it, it, it drives consumption, right? It's really focused on the, the consumer of the data versus the producer or the technical stakeholder of that data. That's, that's one reason why this is really important. And two, it helps you uh, scope and focus on what's really important. And nowadays, uh, uh, we live in a different economic environment. We all feel the pressure to do more with less and focusing on actually what matters and focusing on what, what drives a business impact is absolutely critical. Right, every team and data teams in, uh, as well are under pressure to show, like, hey, how can we be more efficient? How can we do more with less? And so, making sure you focus on the things that are really important uh, um, is critical, and that's where data product thinking is really important as well. Because you start from the business opportunity, you start from the business problem, and you work backwards. And sometimes, when I see data teams fail, 
is because they have too much of a technical thinking uh, and they build something and they build a better mousetrap and they hope uh, the people will come versus starting from the problem or the opportunity and working backwards. Oh, well said. Um, speaking of which, you published something called the Data Office 2025 Vision. Maybe you could describe what that is exactly, some of the key elements and how you see it shaping or informing the future. Exactly. And so a lot of what I already said, I think, Data Office 2025, one, is this combination of playing defense and offense. Scrutiny mm. around security, privacy, compliance, risk is not going to go away. It's only getting more. So you really have to make sure you're doing the right things uh, to kind of uh, you be able to use data well. But also, how do you drive value? And it's, again, this is data product thinking is really important there. Uh, how do you focus on the things that matter? How do you focus on not just the data, not just having, again, a bigger database, but how do you focus on making it easier for people to consume that data, trust uh, trust that data? is really co an important component of there. And then third is also AI. Um, again, we talk a lot about AI. Uh, a lot of experimentation uh, with AI. Data is going to be absolutely critical. I think it's going to be the biggest uh, constraint of actually getting AI use cases in in production. And I think it's a it's a it's now on the data office to kind of step up. I will I would argue, step up or frankly become irrelevant. Because uh, if you don't step up and really help the organization be successful with AI, again by one controlling risks, doing the governance, but two making the, all the data easily available to be used in those models. I think your role is going to be, I think you've missed an opportunity. And so uh, the data office of 2025 needs to play a really important role in this kind of new world of AI, both from an AI governance perspective, from an AI quality perspective, and from a, a data product uh, perspective. Fantastic. Any uh, advice to aspiring data leaders on some best practice at the operational level or strategy side. You see so much across different industries and, and companies. Uh, what advice would you give? It's a yeah, great question. It's a, I think that it, it's a, a bit of a cliche, but I would argue people process mm -hmm. still super important. Mm -hmm. Change management, building that data culture is incredibly important. Technology is only going to bring you that far. Internal Communication, internal marketing, change management, again, is really important. Uh, two, linking what you do to something that is mission critical for the organization. Like, what is the strategy of the organization? What are the top three uh, priorities of our company? And how can I, as a data leader or a data team, support that, right? And again, work backwards, um, whether it's through a data product approach, a data mesh approach. Uh, that's really, really important. It's too easy to just, again, build foundational capabilities, but then the question, especially in this environment, becomes, okay, what's the impact? Is it absolutely critical? What would happen if we don't do this? That's why it's so important to be able to tie yourself to a, a business-critical initiative, and there's no more business-critical initiative, I'm sure, with many organizations than AI today, right? Everybody's rethinking, okay, how is our business going to change through AI? Are we going to get disrupted? What are the opportunities to do things differently? So absolutely tie yourself uh, to that opportunity, jump in, there's a lot of unknown, but it's through doing that you'll learn. And, and so it uh, make, makes also sure that you're not too much of a, a bottleneck, right? You don't want to be the no person. Again, compliance is really important. Risk management is really important, a big part of the job. Uh, but also making sure that you enable people, you enable data scientists to get their models in production. That's how you're going to create a lot of goodwill and impact in the organization. Fantastic insights. So you work across so many industries from uh, consumer goods, Heineken, through to healthcare, a personal passion of mine. You've helped, uh, I see recently, UCLA Health with putting reliable, high-quality, clean data in the hands of healthcare data citizens. Firstly, that must be very satisfying to, to work in the healthcare space, but it's so, so important in this fragmented world of healthcare, siloed world. That must be a, a key area for you moving forward? Healthcare, pharma uh, is a key hmm. area for us since the very beginning. One, very data-driven, if you think about the R&D process uh, and, hmm. and, and pharma. Uh, compliance, privacy, incredibly important, right? Hmm. Uh, uh, patient information is incredibly sensitive. Again, how do you enable those researchers or, or, or people to do more with that data, to be more efficient, discover more drugs, do that faster? while also making sure that they're able to do that in a kind of compliant in a compliant manner. So we work with a lot of very large pharma companies. We work with a lot of healthcare, healthcare systems, healthcare insurers, 
Um, it's an incredibly important space. And now again, with AI, we have a few uh, customers in that in that space that are really kind of on the forefront of AI. It's been a while. Mm. We always think like AI is new, of course. AI is new. <laughs> Generative AI is maybe new, but or, or they have, have, have done AI for a long time and they've done AI governance for, with Kudibra already for a long time. Because again, you, you, the way you do that is incredibly important. Um, you want to get beyond the, the no, this is too risky. And how do you do that? By putting in the right controls. And so again, in healthcare, pharma, a, a tremendous opportunity to do that, uh, to do that well. Wonderful work. And give us a peek behind the curtain at Calibra. What does the life of chief data citizen look like or yourself? Uh, describe the culture, if you would, uh, for the folks yeah, listening and watching. Absolutely. So we're, we're starting in 2008. We're, I would call it, we're at scale now, right? We're significant mm. at scale. Uh, leader in our in our category, we we care deeply about our mission and, and our vision. Uh, I think uh, doing more with trusted data, like I said, is only becoming more important. So I think we have a really important job to do with our our, our customers. Uh, culturally, I think we, we it, yeah, we're very customer centric. It's in the very beginning, anecdotal story. We started in Belgium. Uh, very quickly, we expand to New York. At the time, New York was not the tech hub it is today. It was very much San Francisco, Silicon Valley, even Boston, a bit more on the, on the East Coast. But we followed our customers. We didn't follow our investors. Otherwise, we would have probably mm-hmm. ended up in Silicon Valley. Uh, but we followed our customers. At the time, uh, large financial institutions, which uh, New York obviously is the headquarter of. And it's kind of it's a very anecdotal example of how kind of customer intimacy, customer championship is how we call it, is a big part of our, of our culture. Uh, the other thing you probably hear is, I think we have an interesting combination of kind of our European roots with the ambition and the drive of kind of where we are now in, in, in the US, right? I'm in New York since the last 10 years, but I think it's an interesting combination. We try to make it the best of both worlds and combining mm-hmm. that, it creates, I think, a unique culture, uh, which I think is really, really attractive by having very passionate people that care deeply about what we do, but also with a level of humility uh, uh, that I think is, uh, is, is important as well. Wonderful. Well, uh, as someone who lived in Belgium a couple of years in my 20s, oh, I worked in Brussels and lived in Leuven. I, I hope you're going to get out to the cafes and the restaurants in, in Belgium this summer. Uh, it's, as you know better than I, it's uh, a wonderful time of the year to be yeah. there. So thanks so much for joining uh, and appreciate you uh, sharing the message and, and the insights and the education. Absolutely. And thanks for having me. Thanks so much. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Thank you.